Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. We're back at Upper Iowa University in Fayette, Iowa, and we say thanks to them for the welcome because this is the place to tell the story. Collector Mike Houston has met us here. Matter of fact, recommended we come here. And we're going to talk today about one member of the university recruits. Who are we talking about today? We're going to talk about Philo Woods today, Will. Philo was one of the, the integral members of the university recruits. And the amazing thing about Philo was he was very well spoken, uh, kept several diaries throughout the war. I've heard as many as 15 diaries uh, and, and very descriptive about what was going on. Some men wrote about the weather. It's raining today. It's snowing today. You know, Philo really dug in deep about what was going on. And those diaries were really the centerpiece for a book that was written by Roger Bowen and Charles Clark entitled The University Recruits. And so there's a lot of excerpts from Philo's diary that are in that book. And today we have several items from his collection. There are items that belong to him personally, but also items that he collected and that he picked up uh, while he was serving during the American Civil War. Great. Well, as we look at this collection, this you are the current caretaker of this correction, correct? That's correct. And let's walk through, before we go back to the 1860s, it's always interesting in the 21st century to see how history gets to where it needs to be for the time that we're at. Talk to me about this collection coming to you and why this collection for you. This collection is one that I had heard about, uh, but I'd never seen before. I'd heard about items that were in it. Um, I'm actually involved in living history and, and spent some time as a reenactor. And many of these pieces had been inspected by some friends of mine who used to portray this particular unit. They used to portray the Company C of the 12th Iowa. So I'd heard there was a blanket and a haversack and all these things, but I'd never seen them. The, the collection kind of fell out of the public eye or was protected pretty closely for several years and no one really knew where it was at. Uh, in December of 2022, the collection turned up for sale uh, at a Civil War show in Franklin, Tennessee. And I was contacted by some friends who were at the show and they said, oh my gosh, you should see this amazing collection. And, and I knew right away it was the Philo Woods collection. And I was determined to get that collection back home. And you were at the Franklin show, right? No, I was not at the Franklin show. I wish I was at the Franklin <laughs> show, but I was actually participating in a, in a reenacting event. Uh, we were portraying men of company C, 19th Iowa at the Battle of Prairie Grove. So I was at a reenactment, I had my phone shut off and when I turned it on, it just was blowing up, uh, so to speak, with messages from friends. So where do we go from there to the first time you and I talk? That's a great question. So the collection sells in at Franklin. I find out who the seller was, but I was not able to figure out who the buyer was of the collection. Through some posts on Facebook, that, that buyer eventually reached out to me, and he was in Burnsville, Mississippi. My concern was that this collection was going to be split up. Uh, I wanted to see it stay together, and, and that's where the historical value is, is, is having this all together. And so it, it, in light of or with the fear of it being split up, I traveled to Burnsville, Mississippi to bring this collection back home. Fantastic. Well, talk to me a little bit about getting the collection. Yeah, so this is a, many of the items belong to Philo. And we've also mentioned Roger Bowen and Charles Clark writing this book. And they set out to start telling the story about these boys in the 1960s. And they would spend about one night a week going through those diaries. Uh, they were the diaries of Philo Woods. They were the diaries of Henry Granis. And they would take notes on the diaries. And they did this for several years as they put together the book. As the book got close to being published, uh, there was a lot of people that came out of the woodwork, local community members who were descendants of many of these men. And so they started to bring forward items from men of Company C, 12th Iowa. Uh, so some of the items that we have here that were, you know, personally belong to Philo Woods. You know, we have a haversack here in the case. Uh, we have his chevrons. We have a really cool knife, fork, and spoon combination that I've never seen anywhere else before. There's also some battlefield pickups. There's a saber bayonet here. Philo visited the Vicksburg battlefield about five to six months after Vicksburg fell. He was getting ready to return home on furlough, and he was a collector. So he had been out on several battlefields before, walking around looking for mementos. During wartime. During wartime, that's correct. Trying to pick up mementos and souvenirs from the war. And one of those evenings, right before he left for furlough, he talks in his diary specifically about picking up this particular saber bayonet. Wow. Uh, we also have some shell fragments as well that he's picked up, you know, that are also, you know, documented in his diary as well. 
Fantastic. And we've got an amazing, I mean, I know we've got reproduction blankets underneath, but talk to me about this blanket. Amazing is the best way to describe it. And I've said that a lot today. It's really hard to find original examples of federal issue blankets because they were very important to those men um, in trying to stay warm and trying to stay comfortable. And they, they used them up, you know, until they were gone and issued a new one. This is a great example because it, it has the stencil on it. Company C stenciled on it. Some other interesting aspects about this blanket are just the amount of shoddy that's included into it. You know, these were contract blankets. They had to be a, a certain weight based on, you know, the government contracts. And one of the ways that some of the contractors got around that was they really just mixed junk in a lot of times, floor sweepings. So junk wool, shorter staple. That's, the, that's correct. Back in the digest, we talked back when we talked about staple length, when we talked about merino. And so this isn't made with necessarily top quality wool. That's exactly right. And as you look closely at the blanket, you can see that. You can see those little flecks of color uh, and those little pieces of shoddy that were spun into the wool that was then used to, to, to weave this blanket. Great. I see a stripe here and I see a space here. That's a great observation. That's something that I didn't notice at first. Uh, when I acquired this collection, I sent some pictures to some friends and they noticed it right away. <laughs> and they said, well, what the heck happened to the material above the top stripe? We'll never know exactly what happened to it. We can always speculate, though, and in the reenacting world, you know, guys have speculated that that material has been removed from blankets, uh, and soldiers may have used it as a scarf. Uh, is it possible that Philo Woods, you know, cut the top of that material off to use it as a scarf? We'll never know, but it's and we always... don't have it in his diary or anything, one way or the other. So the diaries are not published in their entirety. The original diaries are are still out there. Uh, I have always hoped that maybe somewhere in one of those diaries, we may be able to find that information. But as of today, no. Okay, fantastic. What are the two wood things? They don't look very military. No, they're definitely not uh, very military. So this is a wood carving uh, that Philo actually made while he was in prison. These men were captured in the hornet's nest at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, spent much of their time in prison in Sel Selma, Alabama. Now you can faintly see some inscription that was made on the base of this, but it was carved by Philo Woods while he was in prison. Fighting boredom was something that soldiers did, you know, even when they weren't prisoners. I can only imagine how terribly bored they were as prisoners. So this is a way to, you know, to spend some time. There's also another wood carving here that's a snake. I've never wow. done much wood carving, but I can only imagine, you know, how much time it would have taken to, to make this, you know, curved snake. But if you've got time on your hands. That's right. What else are you gonna do? Why shoot this here? Well, I really think, last week was homecoming here on campus, uh, but I really think this is a, a homecoming, so to speak, for, for this collection and, and for these men, just to tell their story. Talk to me about the value of a grouping. I know a lot of people in our world enjoy seeing original artifacts and hearing the stories that go with them. As a collector, because I know you've collected well more than just this grouping, what does a grouping hold compared to an individual piece? Oh, that's, it's priceless to have a group like this together, especially a grouping of items that are mentioned in a book or were published in newspaper articles. Um, the amount of provenance that we have on, on this collection really is, is pretty overwhelming. It needs to stay together. So as the soldier's life happens, we see military items, but we also see personal items. You want to talk to me about some of the personal items we see? As far as personal items go, I think one of the, the most personal items that a soldier carried with him during the war was his sewing kit or his housewife, as it's commonly referred to. And, and we talked about how important it was for the women to make their contribution to the war effort. And they did that by hand sewing a flag that they presented to the men when they left home. But they also did that by making sewing kits. And we have a couple sewing kits here that personally belong to Philo. I don't know when he carried which one uh, the one here is, is in a little bit rougher shape than the other. Maybe that's the original one that he had. One of the interesting attributes, I guess, of that particular housewife is the pin cushion here where you see some needles, that pin cushion is actually stuffed with human hair. Wow. Um, and why is that? Great question. And this is something that I try to learn something new <laughs> every day. And this is something that I learned just recently. But that was common to use human hair in pin cushions because the natural oils of that hair would keep your needles from getting rusty. 
So it would, it would keep them sharp and it would keep them clean. And so we can see a little bit of light colored hair that's peeking through that pin cushion. We don't know who it came from, but you know, Philo had some sisters at home. You know, is it possible that maybe it was one of his little sister's hair, you know, that was put into that housewife? Sure, or possibly one of the ladies who were here at the university with him. That's exactly right, and it, and it very well could have been. Whether made specifically for him or a group of these were made for the university recruits. Absolutely, and we know they're just, as we mentioned earlier, they're a very personal item that they would carry with them. And if you didn't know how to sew at the beginning of the war, you know, I can assure you that these men did by the end. Well. I own only a few originals. Text is mostly for me books, but I own a couple of original muskets. And I know the price of a musket that is not identified. And here I'm looking at a grouping. I know you did something for preservation as part of acquiring this. Would you talk to me about how you helped preservation or helped battlefield preservation in this process? Yeah, absolutely. A few years ago, I, I saw a piece of property for sale uh, adjacent to the Shiloh National Military Park. It actually was right adjacent to it and west of Fraley Field where you know the fighting first started at Shiloh. I bought that piece of property and had it for a year or so. And then when this collection sold in Franklin, Tennessee, the only information I had about the new owner was that he lived somewhere near the Shiloh National Military Park. So I had shared that I had this piece of land and I would be willing to trade it uh, to that gentleman for the collection. And he had reached out to me. Uh, he decided that he didn't want to make a trade. Uh, so in order to make this deal work, uh, I ended up selling my property to the American Battlefield Trust. And now the American Battlefield Trust will then in turn donate that property to the National Military Park. So the land that, that I sold, you know, to have the funds and the means to be able to keep this collection together, that land at Shiloh allowed me to keep a, a really historical collection together, which is really pretty neat. Well, Mike, I'm pleased that in public we get a chance. Obviously, this is kept safe and secure, but you're willing to bring it out to the university to bring these boys home, to share it with us, and then what you did for preservation to make this possible. It's sort of a double whammy of historic preservation. And Wow, personally, on behalf of so many people who are our fans and our members and our patrons, I've got to say thank you for all of that. Yeah, thanks, Will. That's a huge moment. So, And thank you for bringing this out. As we come to an end, you've spent time in the last year getting to know Philo and getting to know Henry Granis and getting to know these guys. Any last thoughts you want to share as you get to know these boys better? I think their story is so much like so many other men you know, from, from the American Civil War. Uh, as an Iowan, I'm very proud of the contributions that Iowa made. Uh, per capita, it's said that Iowa contributed more soldiers than any other state during the American Civil War, uh, from the North or from the South. And so their story is so much like so many others. They were fiercely patriotic and, and they were doing what they needed to do to, to preserve the Union. And many of these men, uh, not just the university recruits, but most of the men that served from Iowa, they weren't natives of Iowa. Uh, many of the men who enlisted here in the university recruits, they were immigrants, most of which were from Scotland, actually, uh, that enlisted here with the, the university recruits. So it's just amazing to have these items. The important part about these items is that they help tell the story. And that's why we're here today. And it's, it's helping folks make a personal connection, you know, to something that happened, you know, over 160 years ago. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your part and for sharing this with us, because we know this was hidden for a long time. There's a fantastic story of these 19 recruits from this university. Thank you for making it possible to talk about them yeah. again. Thank you, Will. Appreciate so, you having me. Glad to. Well, thank you for spending your time with Civil War Digital Digest. We say thanks to our patrons, the CWDD Coffee Grinders. Their financial support makes coming here and bringing a cameraman with us and gear possible. This is a gigantic grouping that has come back to life and Mike has shared it with all of us. Hope you got a chance to get a little better connection to the 12th Iowa and their time here during the Civil War. We'll see you next time.